Hello everybody and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. We're coming at you live from Hoss Tools headquarters here in Norman Park, Georgia. We're glad that you're with us today. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg. And uh, we're super excited about today's show. Don't forget about Big Jim. You got Big Jim oh, on yeah, the controls. Right. I forgot about Big Jim on the ones and twos. Everybody say hey to Big Jim. All right. So on today's show, we're going to be talking about some common garden misconceptions. Things that a lot of people call old wives tales or things that we do in the garden. We may not know why and, and we might not necessarily have to do those things. And uh, things that are passed down but maybe not have a whole lot of reason behind them. So we're going to do a little myth busting today with some common garden uh, misconceptions or trends. And um, we'll have our show and tell segment. We'll talk about our tool of the week. Yep. And then we'll also answer your questions at the end of the show. Yep. So, well, let's get st Are you eating on the show again? Well, <clears throat> I'm eating a mother sandwich. And I'm telling you what, I've been eating for the last two weeks now. And this is good stuff right here. Now, I just want to give a couple of tidbits about mother sandwiches, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Oh, so, you got to have a good ripe tomato. And you got to have Duke's mayonnaise. And you got to have good, fresh, light bread. And you need some little hoop cheese on the side. Now, the only thing that would make this better if we had some of Tom Matthews' side meat to go on there. But besides that, it just doesn't even get any better tomato sandwich. One of my most favorite foods out there. How many tomatoes per sandwich? As many as you can get Well, them. I normally like to put about two of mine. I like to really kick mine up a notch. But let's talk about tomatoes just for a minute. Okay. So this tomato right here, you brought me yesterday. Right. That's what brandy wine that I grew. Yep. And this is a Bella Rosa that I grew. That's right. Now this one isn't completely right, but just to give you an idea of this, it's what we call orange color. Right. Now the brandy wine, I've eaten a couple of those that you give me out of your garden, and they're really good and they're really meaty. But I'll be honest with you, that Bella Rosa there on a blind taste test, I don't know that I wouldn't like it better. I, I love these heirloom tomatoes and they're great. But folks, I'm gonna tell you, these Bella Roses right here have got the best flavor, they're disease resistant, and it's one of my favorite varieties. These things are just awesome. Yeah. I try to grow these. I had a couple plants out there in mine that didn't make it disease, ate them up, so I had to get a couple from you. They are good, they're different. You know, they're gonna be a little bit ugly on the other side. That's just the nature of heirlooms. They don't make near as much. So we normally grow the heirlooms because of their quality of eating. And it is nice to switch it up a little bit, but those Bella Roses are just, they're on, they're on task for me. And uh, if you had not grown the Bella Roses, you know, probably want to give them a try. It's a great, it's a heavy producer. It's just a good all around tomato for me. And I've grown a lot of different ones. And I've settled on that one a few years ago, and that's one of my favorites. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> the Bella Roses, the seed on that is a little more expensive. It's what about a nickel a seed? Mm -hmm. But if you think about how many more tomatoes you're going to get because of the disease-resistant package there, it's well worth that nickel a seed. And you're probably going to have to grow your own plants because those plants are nearly impossible to buy at the big box stores. Right. So you're probably going to have to order your seed. And you're probably going to have to grow your own plants to get the Bella Roses. Yeah. And then comparing them, like you were saying, the, the heirloom or brandy wine right here, when you cut it open, it's got a deeper red color to it. It's a little meatier, but I, I can't, I'm like you, I can't tell a huge difference in the taste. My plants, I've got these in cages, and the plants are huge. They're over eight foot tall, but they just haven't made a lot of tomatoes, and the disease is really starting to jump on them with a lot of moisture we've had all this humidity coming into play. Whereas these guys, uh, the plants are looking a lot better. And I've got, I'd say four times, if not more, Bella Roses oh, yeah. than yeah. I have uh, yep. brandy wines. It's just something interesting to try. You got a little room in the garden, but but this right here is our, our main producer. Yeah, I got a friend in town that grows those and he has a lot better luck with them than I do because I have a lot higher insect pressure out here in, in the farming community than they do in town. So if you're doing some urban garden and things like that, you can probably grow those a little bit easier than some people out in a more agricultural or more out in county where there is a lot of you know, crops growing and a lot of insect pressure. Yeah. The other thing is that with the shape of these, it's hard to get 
to eat all that tomato because you got a lot up here that you can't get to around this cracking. Whereas this guy, you can pretty much eat yep. all those tomatoes. I so, agree. Um, those trade offs there. Nice to have these. If you had your market stand, these would certainly draw in some folks. But uh, as far as production wise, that Bella Rosa is the way to go. All right, so give you a little insight on our tomatoes, what's going on. It's tough to grow tomatoes down here, but we try. We try. We love them. And, uh, we, we put up them. salsa. It's one of our go to crops in the garden. Make salsa. We put up juice. We put up whole tomatoes. Of course, we are fresh. It's just one of those crops that uh, that we enjoy growing, enjoy eating out of the garden. Yeah, and we do a uh, we do a survey with our customers every year and ask what the most what their favorite crops to grow in the garden are. And of course, corn's on up there, but the number one crop people love to grow, uh, based on our survey, are tomatoes. It's yep. just what everybody likes. All right, so let's get into our tool of the week segment this week. And this week, our tool of the week is our famous Golok machete. Now, this right here is the best production machete that you will find. Hands down. Hands down. Now, there's not saying that there's not a blacksmith somewhere in, in the boonies that can make a machete better than this. But as far as production machetes... Hands down the best one. And I was just using mine the other day, and I've had it for four or five years to cut down my corn stalks after I got through harvesting my sweet corn. And I, if I would have had a tractor and a rotary mower, I couldn't have got that tractor crunk up quicker than I went through there with this machete and chopped those stalks down. Mm -hmm. This is a Condor brand, which is a, uh, used to be a German company. These machetes are manufactured in El Salvador. Right by a old German company and it's very high quality. You can see the spine on that. That's what they call that back part there. It's pretty thick. And this metal here is 1075 high carbon. What that means is this metal will rust, but it's easily to sharpen and it holds good edge. So it's real good metal. Think about those old butcher knives that your grandma or your granddad had that would turn black get that patina on. It's the same type metal that these machetes are made out of. So we always want to keep your little mineral oil or something on them there to keep them resting. They do have some powder coating on the black part there's powder coating. Nice walnut handle there. We carry several different models of the Condor machete. Mm -hmm. But the Golok, which is which this one is, outsells the other ones a lot. Right. So we sell a lot more of these than we do any other the models and it just fits people's hands well. It's a great machete. Making me a little nervous there. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's a good truck machete. Not only that, but it comes in with a great thick leather sheath. And this leather sheath has a swivel on there so you can put it on your belt. It's a good machete to keep in your truck. Now, I can promise you one thing. If you've got a man in your life or a young man that's needing a birthday present, Christmas present, or anything like that, this is the ideal. Oh, there I go. Yes. <laughs> this is the ideal gift right here. I can promise you they'll love this right here. There's something about men and sharp objects we just love. And this beautiful craftsmanship right here is just gorgeous to look at and it would make a fine gift. And you definitely need one to keep in your truck or your golf cart or at your garden shed. Yeah, and with that high carbon steel, it, it comes razor sharp, but you can get it uh, after you use it a while, get it back sharp really easily. Uh, just wipe it since it is high carbon steel you don't want to put it up wet so when you're done with it yeah. take a towel wipe it down so it's dry and this thing uh, uh, I, mine looks like it's been used a little bit but man they, they sure do last a while and they, they hold the yeah. character really well they're 64.99 64.99 yeah. I think is on the it's side it's a bargain yeah best production machete there is alright so our tool of the week there, and now let's get into the meat of this week's show. And we might ruffle a few feathers this week. Oh, we possibly could. We'll see. We'll see. We're going to talk about some things that you may do or you may not do in your garden that you may not know why you do. Uh, and we're going to kind of break down whether you should or shouldn't be doing them. Common garden myths and misconceptions. That's right. Tongue twister. So let's start with the first one. And the first one, <clears throat> just to kind of give a little background on this, when I came on board here, Hoss was probably four or five years ago, 
I remember getting a call not long after I was here and a fella calls and he was asking about the wheel hoe and he said, can this thing make a row? And I, did, I didn't really understood what he was talking about because in my mind a row wasn't made until you planted it. You didn't have to make a row, you just planted something there. In, in talking to more people and understanding what was going on here, there's a lot of people out there that plant on an elevated surface or an, a hill, so to say. Now or we, a bed. Or a bed. a bed. You could call it a bed. And we've always planted just on the flat ground, and if we need to, throw dirt to it later. But a lot of people will plant on this elevated surface, almost looks like a triangle from the, the flat of the soil. And I, I'm not quite sure where this originated from. Uh, you know, it's, part of me wants to say it goes back to older agriculture where they use tractors and these bedders uh, to mound up the dirt. Yeah, you're exactly right. What happened was when they was farming a lot of dry land, which they don't anymore, about all the land around here is irrigated, but with dry land production, they would throw those beds up there. Then when it got time to plant, they could come through there and knock the top off that bed off, and it, that bed would hold the moisture for that crop to be planted so they could get that dry land crop up with that bedding system. Now that works fine in that type of situation. And even if you've got wet land or you got uh, land that doesn't dry, you know, drain well and stays wet, a bed can still come in handy for those type of situations. But for the average person planting the garden, he needs to plant planting on the flat. And what we call on the flat is just planting it flat. Level. And level, on a level, level area. Now, <clears throat> we got crops that we heal, of course, we've talked about that, corn and potatoes, tomatoes, potatoes, things like that. But when you plant on that flat there, it's a lot easier to manage than it is on a bed. It's so hard to weed the side of a hill. It's hard to weed on the side of a hill. It's a lot easier to manage on that flat. So if you don't have a particular reason to be planting on a hill, and you're doing it because you've always been told or thought that's the way you need to do it, try something a little bit different and plant on the flat and it's going to be a lot easier for you to manage that way than planting on a hill. Nowadays, in a garden situation, we all, we got water. We can water with drip with overhead irrigation. So irrigating, uh, I mean planting on a bed for that moisture is not necessarily a reason to do it. Mm -hmm. Or planting on a bed for just because it's been done, you've seen other people do it, and it was not necessarily a reason to do it. So if you don't have a particular reason for drainage, to be planting on bed, try planting on flat, and I think it'll work out a lot better for you. Yeah, you, you cut out that extra labor step there. You don't have to do near as much soil prep. You can just go out there and plant. Now, like you said, I have seen situations, some market farmers and stuff, where they have too much rain, and they don't have sandy soil like us. Their soil is made more clay and doesn't drain as well. And they'll elevate their beds, not necessarily to a point, but it's more of a flat bed. They elevate, and then the water will kind of go in those valleys and it'll keep things from just getting too waterlogged. It, in that situation, it's very, very practical. But for most people, you don't have those drainage issues. Cut out that extra step and just plant on the flat. Right? Yep. All right. Now our next one here can be, if you, if you go online and do a little research on this, you'll see that it's a little controversial. We're going to talk about something here called lunar planting. Okay, And if you've ever read the old Farmer's Almanac, did you bring one? If you've ever read the old Farmer's Almanac and talked to a lot of the old timers, they believe in planting by the moon cycles. So they think that if you plant on the full moon or the new moon that your garden is going to be much more successful by planting at those times. So let's uh, let's dig into a little science about why they think this is true and then why it might not be true. Okay, so bear with me here while I explain this a little bit. So here's our moon, here's the earth. We know that the moon orbits around the earth when the moon's right here, say we live right here, that would be a full moon, okay? For these people over here, that would be a new moon where they didn't see any moon, okay? 
Now the moon, the gravitational attraction of the moon to the earth is what causes our tides in our oceans, our larger bodies of water. So, as we see here, right here when the moon is closest to the earth here, that's going to be causing a high tide at that point. Over here, be causing a low tide. On the opposite side there, we get some other gravitational force into play and high tide here. So as the moon rotates around, these tides rotate around. That's what causes the tides in our ocean. We get tides in different areas. Okay, so the theory is that the moon, on a full moon or new moon, that that gravitational force also works in the soil. And then it's going to pull water up to the soil level and, and provide more moisture for your seeds to germinate. The problem with that is that gravitational force doesn't work in soil like it does in big bodies of water. So in our oceans, this gravitational force can affect the tides because that water body is connected. Okay, The more things we get in the way of those bodies of water, we lose that, that gravitational force isn't as strong. Comparatively, if you look at the Atlantic Ocean tides versus the Gulf of Mexico tides, the Atlantic Ocean tides are a lot greater than the Gulf of Mexico because in the Gulf, you've got that Florida Peninsula dampening a lot of that gravitational effect. We don't see tides in small lakes and ponds because that body of water is just not big enough to feel that force. Same thing in the soil that water in the soil is not connected. It could be very spotty. So there's not going to be any gravitational force really pulling it up. So there's not a, a, a difference in the moisture level on a new moon versus a quarter moon or anything. So it's a, a more of an old wives tale than it is anything. It's not going to really make a difference what the moon cycle is when you plant. So you, what you're doing is debunking the almanac. I'm debunking the almanac. That's right. I got a little bit of a problem with that. <clears throat> you just schooled me on the moons there. I got all that. Okay. But we do know that the moon has an effect on certain things. On on certain on our rhythm rhythmic stuff. Yes. So you talk to any policeman or anybody in law enforcement, they'll tell you crime is more prevalent on a full moon. They always have more calls on the full moon than they do otherwise. You talk to a nurse and they'll tell you they have more births around a full moon and it has an effect on the birth, mm -hmm. when, when, you know, all that. You, you look at all these things and we may not understand that, but we know that's facts, that, that the moon has an effect on certain things that we may not understand. Now, I don't plant on the moon. I'll be the first to admit that. And the simple reason I don't is because I can't. I have a job, I have to garden when I can, and plus, with the weather like it is, I plant when I can. When it's time to plant, I plant, and I don't go by the moon. However, a lot of old-timers have done that. So I'm not, at this point, ready to debunk that, and i tell you the reason why, is your, your explanation was good there, but there's a lot of things in life I don't understand that still work. So although I don't understand that, I'm not exactly ready to get on the board get on board with you on that i understand it but i'm not ready and we you know what i'd like to hear what other people think i'd like to hear what you think about that do you think it makes a difference whether you plan on the new moon according to the almanac or thing have you seen this difference for yourself so leave us you know something in the comments and tell us what you think about that it'd be interesting to see yeah and if, if, if it just <clears throat> makes you feel better to plan on the moon Go for it, but I'm gonna stick to my my scientific basis here. And uh, if you think the moon really affects germination rate, I've got some oceanfront property in Arizona. Wow! All right. So we just have to agree to disagree on that. We just have to agree to disagree. Okay. All right. So let's get to our third misconception that we're going to talk about. And this one, we we see this a lot. That, so there was a video we put out. I don't remember if it was last year, year before last, but I was using our famous push pull hoe and taking out a big spot of pigweed. And the way the push pull hoe works is that it just skims along the surface. You're really not digging up those weeds. You're just kind of cutting them off at the surface there, clearing out a, a densely uh, weedy area. 
And we get, you'd be surprised, we get so many comments on that video, people saying, well, those weeds are just going to grow back. You didn't pull them up by the roots. And so a lot of people don't understand that those weeds don't always have to be pulled up by the roots. If you disturb that weed structure. And or if you them, take those, those leaves and cut it off, then it has no food source. That's right. So with the exception of a couple of plants, but like maybe nutgrass, right. when you do take that off, then more likely that plant is going to, because a weed is a plant, that plant is going to die. It's the same thing if you was growing, if you take a squash plant or anything like that and cut it off, it's going to have a really hard time coming back. So when you do cut that top off, then more likely that weed is going to die. And a weed is simply a plant that's out of place. So Right. Yeah, and if you, you ever notice, you don't get pigweed growing in your yard. Right. Because it, it can't tolerate that frequent close cutting. Exactly. So if you do that in your garden, and it's a lot easier to get out there and just run across the surface than it is to start digging up and, and, and kind of making a mess. Yeah, you make a lot more time and get them knocked out right away. So that frequent shallow disturbance that we always talk about is plenty sufficient to control most weeds out there. You don't have to take a shovel and dig them up or take a big massive hoe and no. make a divot in your garden. Another thing too, I know we touched on this before, but if you get a rain uh, and your soil kind of gets compacted, man, take those cultivator teeth from that wheel hoe. You may not have weeds coming up yet, but take those cultivator teeth, run through there and bust that crust up and that's going to help with your weed control a lot because weeds have a really hard time germinating in loose fluff, fluffy soil. Yeah. They like compacted soil so that the seed is more in contact with soil with moisture better to germinate than they do cultivated soil. Yeah, so after rain, as soon as you can get in there. Get in there and bust her up. Yeah, yeah. And the cultivator teeth are absolutely <laughs> wonderful tools for that. Yeah, they're probably one of my, our most underrated attachments because they don't look as, as, as sexy as some of the other ones, right. but I think they're probably one of the most yeah. useful. All right, and so our fourth misconception we're going to talk about, and this, this might ruffle a few feathers too, because I'm sure we've got a few listeners that might use this stuff, uh, is compost tea. And so compost tea, if you're not familiar with it, what people do is they take compost, they put it <clears throat> in a water solution, and then they aerate it, use a bubbler or something, and uh, pro introduce oxygen to that compost water solution. And the thought process is there is by introducing that oxygen, you're going to get a bloom of beneficial bacteria and microorganisms in there, which can then be applied to your garden and those microorganisms are going to benefit your garden. So you're, you're trying to increase the microorganism count from that original compost, multiply that and then apply it to your garden. There's a lot of biostimics, biostimulants and compost teas on the market out there today. And if you really you know, dig down into this, there is no scientific uh, research that's been done that says microbes can live in some of these bulk compost teas. Now, they have been a little bit done where if you brew it and you take it immediately and use it, that you get some effect out of that, but it has to be used immediately or otherwise your microbes are gone. So when you do use compost teas, there is some benefits there and the benefits is fulvic acid and humic acids. You get some of the extracts in there for some of those acids in there. But that's really minute for the process you have to go through there to get the compost tea when you simply could use the good compost and got a lot more bang for your book. Yeah, not only is it difficult sometimes for those microbes just to survive in that compost tea environment, but who's to say they live or persist just as soon as you spray them on the plant? Uh, there's also no way to quantify. It would take a pretty high level uh, biology or microbiology lab to actually quantify that increase in microbial production that you're claiming you're getting. So it, it's a lot of, you're trusting this system a lot and a lot of the, you'll see a lot of these on Pinterest and other places, these home ways to do it uh, are just not effective at all. The, the systems where they're making this stuff big scale, supposedly, it, it takes some pretty complicated equipment. You just can't take a, a bubbler from Walmart and pour it in a bucket and really expect to have significant results. And what you're doing there is you're going, you're taking a lot of your time, uh, your money, whatever, to get this extract of this compost tea 
when you can just simply use the cube compost and get all the results you, you need to get. You get all, all those microbes are living in that, that living compost. You get all your humic acids, your fulvic acids, and several more there. Uh, compost is a very complex <coughs> thing, and we don't even understand how it works. But I can tell you one thing. You put good compost on your garden, and it'll make you look like a hero. It does wonderful things, and you get all those great benefits that you was just trying to get out of some of that, of that compost tea. So why go to that extra step? Yeah, and the other thing is, think about this. So you put compost in water, and if, you're, if you really are increasing the microbial populations, those things feed off those same essential nutrients that plants do, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So if you increase those microbes in there, they're going to likely consume all of your essential nutrients that was in the compost to start with. So the bottom line is just use good compost. Just use good compost. Don't waste your time making a tea, making a solution. Just put the dry compost down yep. and you'll be good to go. All right. So that was, that was good information there, debunking a few myths, getting into a few myths, and hopefully we was able to, to clear up some misconceptions for some of y'all out there. And then finally this week, we're going to get into our Q&A segment. And uh, as the show goes along, you know, always put your questions in the comments if you have any, yep. and we'll answer them on next week's show. If we answer your question on the show, we'll send you one of these great little Hoss drink koozies right here, which come in handy in the summertime. If we answer your question, just send us an email to cussserved at hosstools.com with your address and we'll be glad to get the koozie on your way. Okay, so our first question this week <coughs> is from Gary Schmelzer. And I think Gary lives in Florida. He comments a lot on some of our videos. Gary wants to know what pesticide can he use on his sweet potatoes? Uh, says something's eating the leaves and wants to know should he use liquid seven? He can use liquid seven. However, there is a couple products I, I would prefer to use if I could. So if I had just a small problem with something eating on my leaves, I would rotate with BT or spinosad, and I would do that on a weekly basis. So I would spray BT one week, the next week I would spray spinosad. And I would do that if I didn't have a large problem. Now that being said, if I had a big host of army worms come there and started defo defoliating them and eating them down quick, you're gonna have to go some drastic measures. And if you have that type problem, you got to get out there and you got to get something done. You're going to have to probably use something a little bit stronger than you would normally use. And Liquid 7 would do that. Uh, you're going to compromise a couple of things. You're going to have some beneficials that you're probably going to wipe out. But there again, if you have that big of an army worm problem, you got to get something out of there and you got to hit them as hard as you can. The problem with Liquid 7 is you got a seven day interval there between you can spray and you can harvest so you got that little yeah. bit of an issue on there. sweet potatoes it's not that big of a deal, not that big of a deal. Right. you definitely if you did have to resort to the liquid seven you want to do that late late in the evening almost at dark to minimize your damage on oh, the oh, absolutely because seven is pretty hard on your on your bees yeah all right so hopefully that helps you out gary send us an email with your address and we'll get that koozie on the way to you and then our last question this week is from jdb boy and uh, he wants to know what's the best way to get rid of nut grass in your garden. Oh, that can be a tough one. That's right a million-dollar question yeah. right there. Well, <clears throat> you know, I don't have a, a nut grass problem in my garden, and I really can't tell you why, but I don't. I'm thankful for that. Now, i got several other problems, but nut grass is not a problem that I have to fight. However, I see it in farmland all the time. Land has been farmed for a long time, and they still have a nut grass problem. You know, the people out there have used hogs in the past, and I think that's probably a pretty good thing if you're able to do it. If you can paddock it <clears> off and turn hogs in there, they say hogs really love those nuts and forage them, I mean, root them up and eat them. them. And I think that would probably be a good method. However, if you've got a terrible nut grass problem and you want to go a little bit to the dark side and go with the conventional stuff, there, is, there are some things out there that you can do. There's one herbicide out there that we used to use in a previous life called Dual or Dual Magnum, and that's D-U-A-L, I believe. And you can you can Google it and see. It's a pre emergent herbicide, and it works on pigweed, and it works on nut grass, and it works on several other things, and it works really well. And you can actually go over the top right after you plant. However, you got to be really, this is some 
pretty strong stuff, you got to be really careful with it. You got to get your rate down just right. You got to get your speed down that you can apply it just right because if you get too much out there, it's going to root prune your crops. However, it will control nut grass. So if you've got a severe problem and you want to use a conventional herbicide, you can do that. You could use that. I prefer myself not to use those because you can do some damage to your crops and it's just not worth it to me. But it is available. Yeah, for a more environmentally friendly control, uh, it, it's, it's not quite as invasive as the pigs. But So when I first started the garden at the place I live now five or six years ago, I had a bad nutgrass problem. And I, it just seemed like it got less, and all of a sudden I just noticed that we didn't really have any nutgrass issue in there. And what I was doing at the time to kind of reduce the issue is I was alternating between those sweeps and those teeth. And those sweeps really are going to cut the stuff, and the, the teeth are going to really kind of turn everything over. And, and I was doing it with a fairly high frequency, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, and alternating between those two. And I think that it's not as strong, like I said, but it kind of simulates what those pigs would be doing in there too. And so what I tell people is you just, just have patience with it. You just got to be devoted to it and know that it's going to get better if you just stay on top of it. Keep going in there, doing that cultivation. Aggravate it to death. Aggravate it to death. It's pretty much what you got to do. Yep. But nut grass is definitely, that one and pigweed is probably the two toughest weeds that we deal with in the garden. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're pretty nasty. The the nut grass doesn't um, doesn't seed out kind of like the pigweed does as much, but it's got those underground uh, root yep. system that can be hard to extract. Yep. So if you're gonna pull nut grass by hand, make sure you get the whole thing. Uh, or you haven't done anything. If you right. leave that nut underneath there, you haven't done anything. So. All right. Well. Hope y'all enjoyed the show this week. We are out of time this week, and uh, we will see you guys next week. What's on store for next week? Next week, we're going to be talking about watermelons. Watermelons, because it's getting close to the 4th of July, and we want to talk about watermelons. We might even do the watermelon crawl. We may. All right, we'll see you guys next week.